Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I do want to begin by thanking Gila again for spearheading this class. It's a pleasure, and I do want to offer also a special prayers. We've been doing that for the past few months for the author of this book, Rabbi Steinzalt, my dear mentor, um, who, as many of you know, had a stroke over two years ago, and his speech is still not completely, it's not present. Uh, everything else is, but not his speech. So um, we'll begin just with a very um, important and a very special chapter from the book of Psalm, which I'm pulling out right now, which is chapter 45. And as the commentaries explain also, this is a chapter that speaks about speech, the power of speech, and therefore it also has um, blessings of speech, which we will, of course, direct towards Rabbi Steinsatz and his full and speedy recovery. So I'll say it in Hebrew, and we'll proceed. All right. Uh, we were in the middle of uh, the fifth chapter of this book, the chapter called Torah, page 68 in these books, 49. and in that book, 49. 49. If you don't have a book, please feel free to share with those who do, and vice versa. Just to very quickly summarize what we've been studying uh, thus far, he spoke about the essence of Torah. First of all, the Torah is not from heaven. The Torah is heaven. And therefore, when one studies Torah, it's really um, the connection of one's mind to, the, to God, to the divine himself. Um, that was one big idea that he developed. Another big idea is that, um, you know, and that we spoke about, um, if you remember, the levels of pleasure and the ultimate level of pleasure was action, doing good. Not just feeling good, but doing good. Each time you visit the sick, each time you do an act of kindness, whatever it may be, that's the ultimate level of pleasure. More than listening to music, more than uh, the good news of winning the lottery, more than anything else. Um, um, and in a way, that relates to Torah itself, because the ultimate level of study is action. By putting everything that we know from the Torah into action. So when we study about respecting our parents, and we actually respect our parents, that creates the ultimate level of pleasure. In a way, also, that turns the Torah into um, the channel of God in this world, and not the channel of oneself in this world. Uh, he'll be speaking about this a little bit more, but of course, the danger in anything, but particularly in studying Torah, is that we use the Torah, we almost abuse the Torah, instead of really um, unleashing the light of the Torah. What does this mean? That very often we study Torah, why? To make ourselves wise. We use the Torah not really because we care about the divine that's in the Torah, the heaven in the Torah, but we care more about our selfish desires, our selfish needs. So we will say to ourselves, okay, we'll study Torah in order to become wiser, in order to know how to live. Uh, but that's not the purpose. The purpose of the Torah is in order to ensure that God is drawn down to this world, that this world becomes more divine. It's through study, but even more so through action. You have, you are not part of the equation. We are not part of the equation. You know, it's true, I think, in every relationship, not just with God, but in any relationship, I think, marital relationships, in friendships too. If I love you just because of what you bring me, I don't love you. I love myself, right? The example, we mentioned this in the past, but the example is like, people say, I love oranges, I love apples, of whatever it may be. If you really love the apple, you would leave it on the tree. You wouldn't cut its life off. So you don't love the apple, you love what the, the pleasure that the apple brings to you. So you love yourself. And many relationships are like that. I love my spouse, why? Because of the pleasure my spouse brings to me. Because of the stability my spouse brings to me. Because of the children nurturing that my spouse brings to me. So I don't like my spouse. I love myself. The point of a relationship is that the other is not seen as a mean towards something. The other is seen as a goal in and of itself. That's why, by the way, it's connected. I know we want to get to the text, but it's, it's very much connected to one of the most um, incomprehensible, at first at least, seemingly incomprehensible, uh, passages in the Torah. But as uh, you know, there's the, the story of Jacob and uh, the two sisters, Rachel and Leah. Jacob is cheated into marrying Leah, the firstborn. And um, when he comes, he approaches his father-in-law and says, hey, you cheated me. 
I wanted to marry her sister, not 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 Leah. I wanted to marry Rachel. The, sis, uh, the father-in-law says, no, you're going to have to work an additional seven years for Rachel. He says, fine. And then the Torah says this, and I want you to explain this to me. The Torah says that he worked for seven years. Quoting word for word, which means uh, those seven years appeared to Jacob like just a few days because he loved her so much. But one second, when you love someone, if my wife is on vacation and I'm waiting for her to come back, every day seems like a year. Here it says the opposite. Seven years seem like a few days. But if you really love someone, it should be the opposite. Every day should seem like seven years. Can't wait for you to come. Wow, when is it coming already? Right? Don't you feel that way? So, how, so did Jacob love Rachel? How could it be that seven years went by like just a few days? Why, why is it that it seems so long when we uh, wait for someone to come home, wait for someone that we love to come home? That's because, really, we're waiting for a hug. We're waiting for a smile. We're waiting for a kiss back. One of the most controversial passages in the Talmud. <laughs> First things that he did, Vaishak Yaakov et Rachel. Uh, this before they were married, before anything. He kissed her. Um, they, he was in a relationship. But, but I think that the idea is that he wasn't waiting for anything in return. He really wasn't waiting for anything. It's it, it, not to simplify it or to take the juice out of it, but it's almost like loving a mountain. I could look at the Camelback Mountain right here and say, wow, I, I love this mountain. Now, I'm not expecting the mountain to kiss me or to hug me. <laughs> the mountain is at a distance, so it could be at a distance of seven years. But my love is still there. It doesn't diminish uh, itself or, or increase itself, vice versa. Because I'm waiting for anything in return. And that's what had happened to Jacob. For him, it's just a few days, seven years, a few days, same thing. The mountain is the mountain. I love what I love. I'm not waiting for a hug. I'm not loving in order to get anything in return. One of the, the deeper also passages in the Torah. But, but that goes back to our relationship with God. Many people love God. Why? Because God will reward me if I'm good. So you don't love God. You love yourself. You love the rewards. I, I participated in a symposium a few, a few months ago on Anse Yoke, but I was astounded, and I called him out on it. I was with the rabbi who says <clears throat> that the purpose of Torah is uh, to teach us how to live a meaningful life and uh, to teach us right from wrong and, and so on and so forth. I said I never thought about that. I really never thought about that. I study Torah because God created me. And I have to do what my Creator wants me to do. Whether it's going to give me a meaningful life, oh great. Is it going to give me a happy life? Maybe, maybe not. But that's not why I'm doing Torah. I, it's not me-based. It's not self-oriented. It's God-oriented. God is the Creator. God is the Master of the Universe. I'm doing His Torah because it's His world. And because my life is His life. It's not, his, it's not my life. And I think that's the level of relationship we should have in, in every context of relationship, with our spouses, with our friends, and with God. Not expecting anything in return. Now, it's hard to attain that level, no doubt. Because by nature, we are very self-centered. Children are, very, are born like that, right? The whole world evolves around them. They could be very... That's why, psychologically, I don't know if you use this example, but they'll draw a drawing and they'll say, hey, look what I drew, without even showing you the drawing. Because they think that if they see it, everyone else can see it. It's a classic example used by psychologists, but still. So we have to grow out of it as we live life. But it's, it's a level that we ought to attain, that we can attain, that we ought to attain if we are to have real relationships in life. If I love me, then time matters. If I love you, truly you, then time does not matter. Why? Because, again... My love is not dependent on anything. Not on the way you look, not on the way you behave, and not on the way uh, you are in time. Um, but if, if it's me, then time plays a factor because then, then it falls into the calculation of when am I going to receive something? When is that love going to be actualized? That's when it plays a factor. It's a hard, again, it's a very hard level because, like they say, in every I love you, there's an I. <laughs> there's an I that loves. But 
uh, you know, to use the Talmudic expression, I think it's, the Talmud puts it beautifully, and if only we could understand love from those lenses. Talmud says that the word for love in Hebrew is Ahava. Now, uh, within the word Ahava, there, Talmud in Tractor of Shabbat says that there is the word Hav. Havin is an Aramaic word, but Hav means to give. Because loving is about giving. Loving is giving. Love is, is an action, okay? It's a verb, um, not an emotion. And, and in a way, why is love giving? Because love should be other-oriented, giving something of myself. It's not me-oriented. But going back to what Rabbi Stanz is, is saying here, and we'll get right back to the text, but that's why the highest level of pleasure is giving, because uh, is action, sorry. That's, in, in other words, actualizing the teachings of the Torah in, into action. Why? Because uh, the levels before that are very much self-oriented. But when I actualize the Torah into action, and I tra translate it into, again, helping a stranger, smiling at someone, giving tzedakah, visiting, whatever it may be, then I'm actually getting out of my bubble, of my self-bubble, and joining someone else. It goes from the me to the you. I will tell you this. The Torah does love you. And um, um, I don't want to deviate too much, but why does the Torah love you? Because as we said, Torah, heaven, Torah is heaven. It's not from heaven. It's heaven. God does love you. A God wouldn't have created you if he didn't love you, if you didn't think you mattered. So he loves you. That God is embodied in the Torah. That's why there's Hasidim say that on Simchat Torah, when we dance with the Torah, uh, Hasidim would tell people in synagogue, you think you're dancing with the Torah? You're wrong. The Torah is dancing with you. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Talmud also says this. It's a beautiful expression. But it says that uh, in the desert, you know, they had to carry all of the different utensils of the tabernacle, the menorah, the mizbeach, the altar, and so on. Uh, and they all had to actually carry. Many of them actually were, were, were pretty heavy. The only thing that wasn't carried was the ark. Why? The Talmud says, noset nosav. The ark carries those who carry it. They didn't carry the ark. It's the ark that carried those who carry it. And it's a beautiful, it's a very poetic expression, but I think also a very real one. There is a relationship with that ark, with the Torah that is represented by the ark, right? The, the commandments, the tablets were in that ark. We think that we are loving the Torah, but the Torah loves us just as much. I'm going to ask a further question. Is there such a thing as an inanimate object? <laughs> because really everything as we studied more in the chapter of the soul uh, but everything has a soul everything has a spark of God so yes if you just relate to it as an inanimate object then you can't really have a relationship with that but you can have a relationship with the God within it with the spark within it uh, that's another Hebrew word so it says like this uh, that God created man that's when God created Adam and Eve that's the verse that's used Midrash says something beautiful, that the word Adam is uh, the blood of God. Aleph, Dam. You, every human being, uh, so the word Adam is a combination of two, just to be more specific, the combination of two Hebrew words, so to speak. Uh, the first word is Aleph, represented just by that letter, Aleph. And the second word in Adam is Dam, which means blood. So what the Midrash says is that every human being is the blood of God. And what it deducts from this big idea, you can take it in different directions, is that we have to make sure that God flows within us. It's not about us. It's about God flowing uh, within us or through us. And it's about being givers, not takers. It's about doing that which God wants from us, not being distracted by all the uh, self-oriented pleasures. You know, the Midrash, there's <laughs> a cute story in the Midrash that comes to mind about a fox um, you know, fox is seen as sly animal. I don't know if biologically that's true. Apparently, there was a fox that was um, very much attracted by this vineyard. He wanted to eat from its grapes. And uh, this is in the land of Israel. And he noticed that the owner of the vineyard went on vacation, but he was clever. He enclosed the vineyard completely by a fence so that no one can enter it. So the fox went around and around trying to find a point of entry, he couldn't he finally find this little hole in the fence. He said, gosh, I'm too fat to enter that hole. So he's clever. He 
He said, I'm going to fast for three days. Then I'll be able to enter. He fasted for three days. He entered through the hole and ate all of the grapes that he wanted. But then he said to himself, oh, the owner's going to come. If he finds me, I'm gonna, he's going to kill me. I better get out. How am I going to get out? He says, I'm going to fast for another three days. He's going to get out. And so he fasts for three days. And he comes out of the fence. And then he says to himself, gosh, I thought I was clever. That's what it says. I came in hungry, and I came out hungry. <laughs> That's the story of the Medrash. But what's the, what, what's the lesson of the story? The lesson, I think, is very clear. We are sent here to this world, and we get attracted by all these vineyards. So we try and play the game in order to fit in. And then we fit in, and then we immerse ourselves in all these pleasures. But then we have to go out. We don't stay here. I don't know anyone that has lived forever. We don't stay here. So he says, oh, what did I do? I wasted my whole life. So you did the shuva, you come out of the hole, but say, I came in hungry, I came out hungry. It's like nothing has changed. So instead of the fox sticking to his purpose of giving, giving, we each have to give in our own way with our own unique purpose. We get sidetracked by all these vineyards. And that's really the, the big idea, and that's why Torah has to be actualized, really, so that it can serve, really, as, as God's uh, a tool or God's light in this world and God's tool to elevate this world. Anyhow, that's, that's uh, the idea. That's a very short summary uh, that we've been, about the topics we've been studying up until now. Let's go back now to page 68 again. There are many aspects of the Torah. I believe we were there. Does anyone want to read? Let, let's stop here because there's a lot A lot has been said. I think what Robert Stansley is saying here, so there are different realms in Torah. There's the realm of, of um, the intellect. One can study Torah to enrich the intellect. There's the realm of spirituality. And of course, there's the realm of action. What's interesting to note is that most of the Torah is really action-oriented. It's, it's fascinating, but out of the 613 commandments, most of them, by the way, are not applicable today because a lot of them were applicable in times of the temple, deal with sacrifices and things like that. Today we don't have that, unfortunately, until Mashiach comes. Uh, but that was in those days, uh, uh, you know, when there was a temple there. But uh, today maybe out of the 613, so what, there's 200 commandments, a little more than 200 commandments that are applicable. What's fascinating is that most of them, the vast majority, are action-oriented. Name a commandment and you'll see the action. Well, what is that? Uh, tzedakah, respect your parents. Well, all of them are action-oriented. I know of two or maybe three that are not. For example, studying Torah is not necessarily action, but again, we have to translate it into action. Or praying. Praying is more a meditative state. But otherwise, most commandments are action-oriented. You know, it reminds me, Rabbi Steinzoltz um, himself said so be beautifully, maybe sharply, in San Francisco. I remember being with him some 10 years ago, and I don't know if sh I shared with you this anecdote, but... Um, he was lecturing at um, Stanford, and um, at the very end of the lecture, this woman stood up and asked a question and said, Rabbi Steinsatz, you have to put it in the San Francisco, California context. <laughs> so she says to Rabbi Steinsatz, Rabbi Steinsatz, I have a question for you. How can I feel God? How can I come close to God? And Rabbi Steinsatz, being very uh, sharp-minded, and very witty, he responds, how can you come, uh, feel God, how can you come close to God? These are two separate questions. How can you feel God? Possibly, and I'm quoting verbatim, possibly a few milligrams of LSD will help you. <laughs> <laughs> how can you come close to God? You have 613 ways of coming close to God. Pick one. Do an action. That's how you can come close to God. That's really how you can come close, not to yourself, to your feelings, which are very egocentric, but to God himself. Do something. And this is, this is exactly what this is saying. Now, what, what this is also saying is that it speaks, of course, to the heart of the human condition because it's very hard for us as human beings. We are, on the one hand, very physical beings. We still need to eat. We still need to sleep. We still need to pay bills. We still need to engage with this world. On the other hand, we are also very spiritual beings. And finding that balance between flying to the heavens and bring the heavens back, back down on earth is not an easy task. It's, now, I think that's, 
That's what's unique, by the way, about Judaism. Hinduism, for example, will tell you fly to the heavens and stay there. Go, live as a monk in the Tibetan mountains. Don't get married. Fast as much as you can. Have nothing to do with your physical being. Um, the other side of it is the peculiar way, right? Carpe diem. Live the moment, immerse yourself in all the pleasures of this world, uh, indulge as much as you can, forget about your spiritual being. Uh, but the Jewish way is a very complex way. On the one hand, you have to be up there. On the other hand, you have to be down here. And I think uh, in, in Kabbalah, it's called, and we've spoken maybe about this, it's called Ratzov Vashov, to run forth, yet to return, to run and to return, to run and to return, almost like electricity waves. Back and forth. And that's, that's hard. It's hard on the being. It's hard on the psyche. It's hard on the human condition. But on the other hand, that's the only way that Judaism sees fit. So we have to be connected. Yeah, we have to translate this connection to, to action. And um, I think the, the only way to really live in such a way, because that's the way that Judaism asks us to live with, and, uh, is, is to turn everything into a divine experience. So that even when you eat, and even when you sleep, it's a divine experience. And then you don't have a dichotomy. You really have one big divine experience. Uh, how do you do that? Again, when you eat, you say a blessing. You use the energy that food gives you and to do good. It's turning into one big divine experience. But it's hard because we think that God is there. I think that's one of the great problems that I think atheists become atheists, not because they don't believe in God because that the God they were sold is not a God you and I would believe in. It's the God that they were sold, whether he has a big white beard with a carrot in one hand and a stick in the other hand, that's not a God we believe in. And the God that sometimes they sold the God, that's only there, not here, not in the food, not in your sleep, not in your physical activities, not in sports, not in the gym, not in your bedroom. That's also a God I don't believe in. And they're right to become atheists if that's the God that they are sold. Uh, the God we believe in is a God that's, that's, is a God that's all pervasive, permeates every area of life. And I think that's really the only way to be able to, to go back and forth, back and forth, Ratzova Shov, Ratzova Shov, without hurting ourselves. Everything is divine. Uh, I think that's how the righteous live. That's why, that for them, really, whether they engage with a small child, or whether they're studying the deeper secrets of Kabbalah, for them it's the same activity in essence, because they're connecting to the to God, to the divine. Either way, um, and that's the story. You all know the story of, of the Talmud, right? The story of Rabbi Akiva and the three additional sages who entered the secrets of the Torah, and it says that Rabbi Akiva was the only one who could, who nichnas b'shalom v'yatsa b'shalom, went in peace and came out in peace. The three others, something happened to them. One of them, Ben Azai, went to study the secrets of the Torah and he died. From that experience, just he expired. The, his soul left his body. It was too strong for him. The, thir the third one, Ben Zoma, became crazy. And the fourth one became a heretic, Elisha Ben Abuya. He left it all. Um, but Rabbi Akiva is the one who went in peace and came back in peace because Rabbi Akiva was also a person who was a person of the world, but he knew how to find God everywhere. Many stories about Rabbi Akiva, but remember the story we shared just a few weeks ago about him laughing when the temple was being destroyed. He saw God within those flames. Simcha Bunim of Shizcha, Eli Wiesel used to quote him a lot, but he would say that if you're looking for fire, you'll find it in ashes. He says, to find fire in fire, that's easy. But to find fire in ashes, not everyone can do it. But fire is there. If you believe that there's a God in everything, he's also in the ashes. That's, that's, it's hard to do, but that's, that's really what Judaism believes. And therefore, Judaism can ask of men to be in both places at the same time. So do you know, you know the custom that uh, many, many have on the night of Shavuot, we have it here, not to sleep all night long, right? Why, why do we not sleep the night before Shavuot? And there's a midrash that tells you why, and that's because when the Jewish people received the Torah for the first time on Mount Sinai, God had to wake them up and say, hey, I came to give you the Torah, why are you sleeping? <laughs> now, that, in order to rectify that, we stay up all night long to say to God, look, it's Shavuot, 
We're staying up. We're going to be up when you give it to us. But why were they sleeping? Especially, they were excited to receive the Torah. There's many descriptions in the Torah itself about the Jewish people. So if you're excited, right, you don't fall asleep. If you're going on vacation, you're excited to go to Hawaii. The night before, it's hard to sleep. You're so excited, right? Or whatever excites you. But why were they sleeping? And this, the, the books of Kabbalah explain this. That is that the Jewish people thought that Torah, after all, is spiritual, it's divine, it's heavenly. The best way to receive it is to be divorced from our body. So let's sleep. And then we can become, our body will be sleeping, and our soul at least will be able to receive the Torah. And God had to come and wake them up and said, no, excuse me, I didn't give you the Torah for your soul. I gave you the Torah for your body. Your soul doesn't need the Torah. Soul is me. <laughs> I gave you the Torah for your body. I gave you the Torah for this world. So, so wake up. Your body needs to receive it. And that's why we stay up every night, every Shavuot, sorry, to show God that we learned the lesson. That now we walk, we're, we're, we're expecting the, our bodies to receive the Torah. Now, in a way, that's, that's what we said about Judaism. I think that's what's unique about Judaism. Now, Judaism says that it's the body that needs to be divine. It's the world, the physical world that needs to become divine. And therefore, God is to be found in it also. God is to be applied to it also. It's not just uh, meditating in Tibetan mountains. Absolutely, right. The vessel, the channel, the conduit, you can call it how you want. Right, but by it becoming a vessel, then it's receiving the Torah. Then the Torah can permeate. Right? Good point. But if it's not a vessel, if, then it blocks almost the Torah from really being absorbed by it. And, and in a way, I think that's, that, that helps us again, going back to that human condition of we're told to be spiritual, but to be physical. No, no, no. The physical needs to be spiritual. So you're really told to be one thing, to be spiritual. But how you're told to do that is different from other religions. Not by divorcing yourself from physicality, not by falling asleep, quite the opposite by turning your physical life into a spiritual one, allowing God to come in. Right? Like the Kotzka Rebbe said, where is God? Where you let him in. Not everywhere, wherever you let him in. So by allowing God to come into those physical aspects, then we're really fulfilling the purpose for which we were created, really, for the, which the world was created. And that, that's really what it means. I think this is what Rabbi Shtanz is saying here, translating the Torah into action, into a physical action. Act of tying in, I'm just re repeating this, this a line, which is very powerful. The act of tying in with God's will by means of physical action provides a simpler, more natural, and of course, more essentially direct contact for man as he is. Okay, let, let's continue from, unless there's more questions, let's continue um, from where we left it here. From within its own terms, moreover. Does anyone want to read? It's interesting to note that um, it's consistent with Newton's law, one of Newton's laws, that every action is a reaction, right? It, it's, it's true not just in the simple realm of this world, but it's also true in the realm of all worlds. Remember we spoke about the four worlds and how God sits on his throne and beyond, uh, beneath that there are four worlds. There's the world of emanation, the world of creation, the world of formation, and the world of action, which is this world. When a person does a mitzvah, when a person does a good action, what he's actually doing is that he's, uh, he's ensuring that what started here with the throne of God is now finding its destination here in this world. And when it finds its destination, then that person creates a link between this world and the throne of God from which it emanated. So the action itself is not just something that is happening in the realm of this world. But it's something that is finally creating that link between this world and, and the next, and the throne of God himself. And therefore, it is also tying every aspect of this world where the mitzvah is performed to its root. Maybe it's very simplistic, but it's really very profound. When there's a king that uh, governs over uh, an empire. Now, the king has a connection to all of the people he governs on, right? Because he's their king. And they have a connection to him because, again, okay, he's their king. But the connection becomes much deeper, much more powerful 
when the king stops someone in the street and says to him, hey, can you please get me a cup of water? Now the connection is so much deeper. Why? Because now there's a direct link between the desire of the king and the person himself. It's not just a governorship link. It's a connection. It's an actual connection. That cup of water, that action, creates a connection. We have the opportunity to do that with God each and every day. Each time we do a mitzvah, we connect not just to, oh, it's nice, I helped someone else. We connect to God himself, to the desire of God himself, to the king that governs over us. And in a way, there's no greater, therefore, no greater connection than the connection of action. Um, I, hope, I hope I'm explaining this well, but this, this is the big idea. Um, I th that's what we always say here, you know, that Judaism is a do-good religion, not a feel-good religion. We, we believe in action, um, action that makes us. I've yet to go to a funeral where the eulogies are about a person's feelings, how he felt, how he woke up in the morning. It's more about how they, what they did. What did you do? What did you do in this world? Not just profession-wise, but what you did for others. That's what it's about. And I think that's, that's because that's the way God created the world. He wants us to be action-oriented. But again, every action creates a ripple. So, so there's no doubt. They say, and I don't know if that research um, was, was finalized or even led to any veritable conclusion, but in 1968, the famous scientific research that the flaps of, uh, of the wings of a butterfly in, what is it, in Brazil creates a tsunami in Indonesia. <laughs> so there you go, even the flaps of a butterfly. So imagine how much more so uh, your action, your mitzvah, uh, what type of ripple effect that creates, a spiritual tsunami. But I will say this, you know, we, we live in a world where we only see this world. We only see bodies. We only see soil and trees and walls. But imagine the opposite. Imagine if we lived in a world of souls where we could not see bodies. And then we would also see the power of our actions in a much more real and veritable way. And then we would see, you know, the, the author of the Tanya, which Rabbi Shnels mentions a few times here in this book, Rabbi Shnels Zaman of Liadi, and the Zohar itself also speaks about uh, when a person does a mitzvah, then I'm going to quote in Aramaic, Ista lekika de kucha bechulu halmin which means that the, the light of God um, shines through all the worlds. One mitzvah you did, there's a light there, there's a connection like no other. Then it goes on to say that the angels tremble in front of that light. Each time we do that mitzvah, now it could be an action, it could be just controlling ourselves from, from speaking negatively or from doing something impulsive. Every time you do that, it creates a slight, and, and then it continues to say not only do the angels tremble, but then it brings blessings to the person that's performing that mitzvah much more than he can ever think. Tonight and tomorrow and the day after is Rosh Chodesh. It's the beginning of the month of Adar, of the second month of Adar, in which we'll be celebrating Purim. And it's, it's also, it says, Adar marbim besimcha, which means that when uh, Adar comes in, then we have to increase in happiness. Now what's interesting is that, and I've said this before, so... Um, for some of you, I may be repeating myself, but um, it's interesting because in Hebrew, there are two words for happiness. One word is osher, like ashrei yoshvevetecha. Osher means joy, maybe. Another word is simcha, which is happiness. What's the difference between the two? Osher is happiness that you feel. So it's mainly dependent on the outside. If someone makes me feel good, I feel good. If there's good news, I feel good. If I go to a concert, I feel good. Uh, depends which concert, of course. Uh, I'll let you decide that. <laughs> then I feel good. Um, the simcha is entirely different. Simcha is happiness that we do. When we do good, it brings happiness. And what we are told is that during this month of Adar, one has to increase in happiness, which means one has to increase in doing happiness. And that's why the theme of Purim is really other-oriented. We give mishlach manot. We give food baskets to others. We matanot levyonim, charity to the poor. We share a meal with friends and family. We, uh, you know, get dressed up. We, we make people happy. Not people get mixed up between Halloween and Purim. And I hate it when people compare the two because they diametrically oppose. <coughs> Halloween 
comes to bring fear, all these ghosts. Uh, Purim does the opposite. We, we are supposed to bring happiness. Uh, in Halloween, you take candies. In Purim, you give candies. You give Mishlach Manot. There's so many other uh, comparisons that where well, you'll see that's completely the opposite, but, but that's the idea. Purim is about giving and giving, and the more we give, the more we'll be happy, the more we'll be Simcha. So really, there should be a month of true Simcha, of true doing happiness for each.